Hello, good morning, good afternoon everybody. Sorry we're starting a bit late, but I think it's important to crack on. Obviously we haven't got a lot of time. Uh, I'm Rana Jawad from the University of Bath. I uh, have the honour of timekeeping, but the, the greater pleasure of introducing our three speakers and all of yourselves to this really interesting session, uh, thinking about evidence and policy making in the specific context of social protection and cash transfers which, as we know, are, are very big um, policy and, and academic ideas um, in developing countries and beyond. So, um, basically, the plan is that each of our um, speakers will have about 10 to 15 minutes to present their papers uh, or their ideas. We'll take some clarificatory questions, and then we'll have some bigger discussion at the end, and obviously hear your questions, thoughts, and comments. Okay? Um, we are not following the sequence of, author, of uh, presenters in the program, uh, roughly speaking. We will start with the gentleman on my right-hand side, and I'll, and I'll introduce him properly in a minute. So, um, very first uh, speaker is my colleague, Theo Papadopoulos, who will talk about the key issue of quantitative research and cash transfers in Latin America. And then we'll move on to Joe Devine, who will talk about extreme poverty in Bangladesh. And I'm very pleased to welcome our outside speaker, um, Charles Luango Ntali, who will talk as well about social protection in East Africa. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, I would like to welcome you to Bath. Nice to see very, a lot of faces I know and quite a few people I don't know. Um, my um, presentation um, uh, is on uh, the, some of the recent work I've done with um, a couple of colleagues from uh, Mexico and other Latin America countries on uh, looking at the con conditional cash transfers in Latin America. And I put up this um, rather pretentious title, but anyway, we'll see if uh, we, I manage to, uh, to meet the expectations. Politics of evidence and evidence as politics in the case of conditional cash transfers in Latin America. So, um, the, um, what are the conditional cash transfers to start with? For those of you who might not have heard it here, I've um, borrowed um, from uh, a paper by Lomeli. 2008, uh, 10 features of these programs that um, are supposed to be the consensus, if you like, that informed, uh, that was shared among the promoters of the CCT programs, so it's to be shared. Um, so, first of all, the, uh, the programs, a um, bit of history programs, they have about, about 20, nearly 20 years now of history behind them. First developed in Mexico, Brazil, and then uh, proliferated in other um, Latin American countries. Uh, key principle uh, it was that they are respectful of market principles, uh, although there are public interventions. The idea here is that they enhance uh, the human capital of uh, children through investment in education, nutrition, and health. Um, they were they were very much informed by uh, something that we call the social investment perspective, uh, combining it with traditional social assistance measures. The idea was also that they're going to try to break the intergenerational uh, poverty transmission. The programs are supposed to focus on critical points in the life cycle, where support with schooling, nutrition, and health checkups, uh, as well as income, can have major impacts. Uh, <clears throat> the idea was also that they, they had a, an, a, a kind of a theory about, about behavioral change as part of the design, uh, changing poor families' behavior through conditions that supposedly will encourage them to become more economically rational and efficient decision makers. Um, they were seeking to promote education not only by covering the direct schools of, uh, cost of schooling, but also by offsetting the opportunity costs generated by having children go to school instead of work. Uh, they are budget sensitive, uh, they use selective targeting to efficiently allocate uh, support for the neediest of poor households, that's what it was claimed, that was the theory if you like behind it. And um, the last two, CCTs transfer resources directly to individuals, they can be seen in that respect as moving away from let's say uh, clientelistic kind of uh, arrangements, avoid bureaucratic or political intermediaries. And also, and very importantly, at the heart of the development of these programs was the <coughs> idea that these programs would be evaluated. 
So from the very beginning, evaluation was very much at the heart of the design of the programs. So using the same uh, uh, kind of uh, really good review, and then I will come to, to the review that we have done, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look a little bit about what happened all this uh, during a period of roughly about 10, 12 years when uh, uh, um, uh, the author um, did a, a review of the CCD's performance and achievements. But I have to put that into a kind of framework so that we, you will see how um, these evaluations, if you like, fit into the broader constellation of, of evaluation. And I'm borrowing here uh, um, a graph, if you like, called a figure from uh, Chen's uh, book on uh, practical program uh, evaluation, where he, he basically describes the different kinds of <coughs> um, uh, the, different, the different stages, if you like, in evaluation uh, in, in a scheme that he describes as integrative process or outcome evaluation. So normally you have the program rationale, uh, program implementation, intervention, intervention directly affecting determinants, and then the idea is that you uh, will have some outcomes, uh, some impact, if you like, to society, economy, uh, more generally. So a lot of these evaluations that I'm going to talk about uh, although they call themselves evaluations, they, they are actually, in a, in a, in a, in a narrow sense, uh, they were very much evaluating the implementation successes or the, uh, the action theory success, if you like, how far they were, you know, the programs were meeting uh, the objectives, if you like. And, and very few, if, if uh, very, very few actually looked at making the links, if you like, between the effects of these programs in the, on the macro level which in a sense will allow us to evaluate the conceptual theory, social investment, how far these programs affect, if you like, they, they will uh, have a, a, a real impact, a long-term impact, if you like, uh, on, uh, on society and, and behaviors more generally. So in a sense, they were not capturing the conceptual theory, if I can call that success. So very, very quickly, um, uh, the effects of the programs, um, Again, I'm borrowing here a, 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 a table from Lomeli. Uh, in terms of school attendance, school enrollment, school living, and school learning, uh, the first three, there were in generally uh, positive results. Uh, uh, certainly in terms of school enrollment, uh, a lot of data on that, general increase. Um, but school learning, there were uh, they were not that it wasn't very clear that there were positive effects, but certainly the, the attendance of, of school, uh, schools and enrollment has uh, increased. In terms of health outcomes, um, uh, in terms of having regular medical checkups, receiving uh, prenatal uh, or postnatal care, care of growth for children, vaccination, mortality, uh, incidence of illness, etc., they were all, you know, all recording positive uh, results. Uh, there were some cases where there were non-existent effects, but anyway, the, the general pattern is that. In terms of nutritional outcomes, the picture here was a little bit more mixed. There was a general increase in consumption uh, of, uh, of, 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 of food and the spending on food, no real effects on food supplements, the diet seemed to have improved a little bit, uh, infant weight and height uh, mixed effects. Uh, some uh, uh, results on anemia they were disappointing. They, they didn't seem to have any, any serious effect, uh, but that was the picture. Uh, and this is basically a summary of what I've just uh, said. Uh, in terms of poverty, uh, which was one of the biggest claims, uh, one of the, I won't say that's the only one, but certainly one of the claims, the consensus was it looked like the, the CCT program had a greater effect at reducing the intensity of poverty and probably lifting people out of the extreme poverty rather than actually lowering its incidence. And uh, they were also recorded, there were, there were also re um, uh, uh, evaluations where we record, there, there was a recording of, uh, they were fishing at reaching targeted uh, populations and there were some kind of um, also um, records of uh, evaluations were, that indicated that there was some degree of re-empowerment, especially for women, uh, but also the improvement in security of households, etc. 
But in terms of the limitations, that's uh, how much? Five minutes. Oh my God, I didn't even start it. <laughs> okay, in terms of limitations, there was some uh, uh, little or no effect at performance in school or the amount of learning. Uh, the most important thing I would like to mention here is this one here the current link between education and earnings may not prevail in the future as levels of education rise. There were some simu simulations indicating that this um, uh, school uh, enrollment might result in the future uh, uh, in improvement of future earnings, but that was, that was not uh, uh, seriously evaluated and it wasn't very clear. Um, Lomeli writes that the desire of the, the, the CCT theories to show positive results and the urgency with which they promoted these social experiments seem to have played a key role in constructing a very optimistic vision about the CCTs. So um, what I'd like to give you now is that what we've done uh, and, you know, if, if, if nine, eight, nine years after Lomelli did her review, which was actually to, we didn't do an extensive review of other evaluations, but what we've done is that we tried to, uh, uh, to evaluate <coughs> that part. And what we have found, and because I have very little time, I cannot go into massive detail here, I have some pictures here, is that when you actually put <coughs> the, the spending on CCTs against, against uh, the extreme poverty reduction, um, what you will see is that uh, the, the picture is very mixed. In some countries that they spend very little on CCTs, they actually uh, achieve a quite a substantial poverty reduction, while others that they spend uh, a lot of on CCTs, uh, they don't seem to reduce uh, a, 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 a poverty that much. So there is not a strong correlation between spending <coughs> or reductions in extreme poverty. <coughs> I can give you the details of the paper later. I'm running desperately out of time. But <laughs> what I want to show you, however, is that uh, the, this is the important message here. Several countries in the region devote less resources on CCP and yet perform better in terms of poverty reduction. So how did that happen? And this happens when you have, and that's the message that we, 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 um, we, we will be able to offer. CCT seem to be working only in cases where uh, they are um, uh, together with uh, what we, structural interventions in the labor market when average earnings are you know, increasing or have increased, when min minimum wage have increased, when protection of workers has increased. So in, if you take the totality of that, then the CCTs work as part of the package. But if you, if you just have the CCTs on their own, like in Mexico, for instance, you might have alleviation of extreme poverty, but n n nothing really uh, more than that. So, the, the, you know, not, not that much. And that's, that's especially the case of Mexico is actually uh, uh, illuminating this. So the bottom line, and here you can see some of the effects of Uruguay that increased dramatically the, the minimum wage actually records very substantial reductions in, 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 uh, in, uh, in poverty. So, um, what I would like to say, you know, again, I know I'm running out of time. CCTs are not enough. If the ultimate idea was to reduce po poverty, then they seem to work better when they are accompanied uh, as part of a wider package of measures. And if we take that argument, if you like, uh, further, what does this say about the politics of evidence and the evidence of politics? I mean, this is where I'm elaborating the schema. I, 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 I told you everything. We need, of course, the, the evaluations that these programs came with, you know, the, the evaluations of implementation and action theory, etc. But we also need to do these other kinds of evaluation where we take the big picture into consideration. And that's a political decision. And to some extent, the IMF and the World Bank and all that decided not to go down that road for all these political reasons, which I can elaborate. But this is very important because that leads us, if you like, to create, if you like, or to argue for new policy frames so that we can conceptualize problems and develop programs, you know, so we can have, if you like, more effective, if you, even in, in their own terms, uh, programs. And that requires a new politics of evidence, globally, as well as in international, uh, you know, in national organizations. I'll, I'll stop here. Okay? Um, so, for those of you who know me, then, as ever, I'm taking a lot of credit here for things that I didn't do. Um, this is, this is a reflection on work that I've been involved in since 2008, um, but there's been others in the room, Mathilde and Jeff have been involved in it as well. Um, and I kind of rewrote, kind of last minute, what I was trying to think about here, because um, 
In the process of this program, I'm going to look at, um, I, I fell on, I clicked upon something which I knew, um, but this helped me think about it differently. Um, and the problem with it is I haven't quite got that thought to where I want it to be, so it's kind of parked there, I need to come back to it and everything else. And it starts from the premise of what I was asked to do today, which was move away from the content of people and start using qualitative research and think, how does qualitative research impact, if at all, on policy? And the case was this work on extreme poverty. And the more I thought about it, the more I realised, ah, why are they asking me that? They're asking me either because I'm rubbish at numbers, true, um, or because that's a kind of old familiar question. And the more I thought about the question, the more the answer became, not does what does qualitative research do in relation to policy, etc., etc., but what does a qualitative researcher do in relation to the dynamics of policy process and everything else? So what I'm trying to do and what I want to do by the end of it is actually to, to invite us to kind of throw away that old question about what does quant do and what does qual do? But be more comfortable with a bigger question, which is what do quantitative researchers do about policy and what might qualitative researchers do about policy? And hopefully, um, I'll be able to show you how I got there. Um, at one level, this relationship between research, and knowledge, and policy, and impact and engagement, it's not new. It's been around for a long time. And, and, and how we kind of position that relationship um, becomes important. Today, it might become slightly different because we've got all this thing about evidence-based, we've got the whole mantra about what works, etc., etc. So perhaps in what's increasingly becoming knowledge economies, where there's a premium about being competitive in the production and generation of knowledge, then this becomes a bit of a more important question. But it's not just governments and donors who are interested in that knowledge economy. Researchers and academics love it as well because we also fight amongst ourselves to see what's the right kind of knowledge or what constitutes the right kind of engagement between research and knowledge. So start with Einstein. And what's that fight about? The fight's about what do we define as and what counts as scientific <coughs> knowledge. So there are things, a lot of us spend a lot of time counting things that are not important and not counting the things that might be important. We all do that. Um, that, again, I think, has become more important as these different agendas come up and these kind of sentences that flow into this evidence-based discussion um, without any kind of question. And I started, I should start with this one, of course, when we get this idea that knowledge, we'll let knowledge speak to power. And we almost kind of take knowledge as something which is out there, and all we have to do is to kind of mould it a bit into some sort of policy structure or shape. And what we're doing in that process, it seems to me, is that we're almost conflating. We're making a very direct relationship by what we call evidence and then what we call policy. And I suppose the first step of what I want to try and invite us to think about is not to be, not to be tempted by that direct association. I don't think there is a direct association between evidence and policy. If there is an association between evidence and policy, it's always and only and can only be mediated through something. So it's an indirect and it's made <coughs> direct. And so I suppose what we're going to um, talk about in the work that we've been doing is that process of making an association between evidence and policy, as opposed to assuming that evidence just sits out there unproblematically and that it's got a direct relation to policy. Um, so what's the starting point? If knowledge and evidence is relevant to policy, and I think that it is, it's only relevant to the extent that it either supports or undermines a particular argument, a particular position, or a proposition. And what does that then ask us to look at? Not so much the direct finding of the evidence that's out there, but to start looking on that interpretative glance, that kind of argumentative context that actually breathes life into knowledge, turning it into evidence, turning it potentially into something which may or may not um, have an impact on policy. So here's the, the programme, as it were, um, summarised in one slide. Um, it's been fair to say, I think, and I'm looking at other people, it's been a long eight years. Um, 
This started off with a program which was a huge investment, 80 odd million quid. And the whole idea at the beginning was devise a program that specifically targets what they wanted to call the extreme poor. And the idea was to make a distinction between non-extreme poor, let's call them moderate poor, and the extreme poor. And the rationale behind it was um, Bangladesh had had a huge amount of success, mostly through NGOs, but not exclusively, in targeting, let's call it the moderate poor. But there was a significant section of society that hadn't taken part, hadn't been involved in those programmes. And hence, around the mid-2000s, there was one or two initiatives set out, and the whole idea was to try and do something about extreme poverty. This particular programme then took on the modality of a challenge fund. In other words, it set out calls, and NGOs responded to the calls with different ways of how they were going to deal with extreme poverty. This was blind peer reviewed, and then um, disbursements were made, and the programmes went on. The overall aim was to get a million people, help them out of extreme poverty. So you can already see there's a kind of threshold game going on here. What does it mean? We hadn't quite thought about it. Does it mean moving out of extreme poverty into being poor? Does it mean moving out of extreme poverty into being super rich, whatever? And there was kind of four core components to it, which kind of blended eventually into two, I think. One was implementation. On the one hand, big scale NGOs, so that we can get the numbers in to get to one million. But also some sort of in innovation. Smaller NGOs trying things. Probably not as successful as, as at least some of us would have thought. And then a lesson in learning and advocacy, which quite rightly over time came much closer together. So the programme went on, we were involved in it from the beginning, and our job basically was to look at the lesson learning and advocacy stuff, if you want. Put the clock forward to 2016, and you've got this seven five year plan. So the government of Bangladesh, like other governments um, in South Asia in particular, do these huge five year plans. And these are important, not just symbolically, because they basically set the tracks for government spending and priorities for the next up until 2020. So if you're in, it's good. And if you're not in, it's always going to be a struggle. And part of what we were trying to do was to try and get government to take control of this project, to kind of take on the notion of extreme poverty, because at the beginning, they too resisted the idea of extreme poverty. And every time you mentioned extreme, they would quite rightly say, is all poverty not extreme anyway? So there's a bit of distinction there. We think this is, this is, this is what we think we've got to. In section 2.9.3, for the first time ever, Bangladesh puts a part of its seventh year plan entitled The Greater Focus on Extreme Poor. Never before done. And of course, what we're going to say is that this is all part of our great work here which to some extent, um, of course, it, it, it was. So a shift, a real shift in policy terms, and a significant one, because this does make a commitment. <coughs> then what the government of Bangladesh does with that commitment, we'll have to see over the next few years. But it's taken on board an argument. We won the argument if we would. And there's been a recent evaluation which kind of curiously said, this is actually the best legacy of the whole programme. This was achieved, but it was achieved yesterday. This is the real legacy, and of course we're not sure where it will go. Which was a bit of a turnaround for us, because for years we were fighting for something like this, and kept on getting dragged back into it, to this. And the way that we had presented it, almost from day one, was the million people is to some extent the low-hanging fruit. If you've got eight or a million quid, you should be able to get a million people out of poverty. It's not that difficult. It shouldn't be that difficult. Whether they stay out of poverty, second question. So. What was this being done in a particular context? What we were trying to do through the research was to push for something that wasn't more high, a bigger agenda. What we were faced with was a rather complex environment, and I can't go into it in detail, of course, a complex political environment, political parties, bits of repression for civil society, lack of space, the personalization of policy, etc., etc. But also a policy world that was very open and very keen and very well trained in the technical side of policy. Less so in the, let's call it qualitative side. So mostly trained in economics and, and, and therefore open to policy influence as long as it came through a particular medium, the technical and the quantitative. But also within the project itself, attention. Because we were all looking for different ways of evaluating, judging how would this project be a success. 
For most of the eight years, the notion of graduation was the one that was winning. And it was this idea of get someone over a threshold, project success. Some people pulling their teeth and being dragged into saying the graduation agenda isn't really the big prize. It's part of the, the low hanging fruit, if you want. So, how did I come around this? Well, um, um, first of all, I need to. James Copestick, he was the one that threw this at me at some point when I was talking to him about it. Um, and James is an economist, but a but, yeah, good economist. Anyway, he gave me this book, and I'm sure he gave it because he doesn't know how to pronounce that. And um, neither do I. So if there's anyone from Denmark, I'll let them have a go. For the moment, we're calling them bent. Um, <laughs> and he puts out three different types of knowledge. And this is where the turn in me started. And I don't know where this is going in the moment. You've got the epistemic knowledge. And this all comes from Aristotle, which had intellectual virtues. The epistemic knowledge is basically that which is universal. Knowledge that you can get and can apply in most places. And what's the question that it's answering? What is objectively true? Okay. The second is the technique. And this is knowledge which is gen generated a lot through pragmatic rationality, doing things and getting things done and finding solutions. What's the question that it's responding to? What works in practice? And the third is phronesis. And this is the nice one. Knowledge that reflects and is engaged with values and interests, quite explicitly. And what are they asking? Where are we going and why? Why are we doing what we're doing? Okay? And then Aristotle's formulation in what Bent tries to get us to think about the validity of social sciences is this actually, it's for social sciences, has far more weight than these two. Because this is the one which kind of keeps those two in order. And I suppose part of the discussion that I was having with James threw it at me was my frustration because we were all rushing to the, the top one, which is the one which reflects that part of policy which is looking for rational, ordered, structured responses to cost benefit, evidence based, etc. etc. So they're beginning to think about how do you get the values into the bigger question about where are we going with this? And I suppose what we were trying to do then through the project was to build up in one minute um, a set of propositions that played with the one million graduation um, um, epistemic need to find out if the project is a success, but at the same time then trying to challenge various people, project through to citizens, through to politicians, about the bigger picture. What kind of society do we want? And what kind of society then will make the one million, if it's successful, sustainable? So part of our argument had been if we can get to what in political science are calling a resettlement of the political contract, in other words, a change in the way that welfare is distributed, then at one level the problem of extreme poverty would be A, owned more by the Bangladeshis, and B, long term there's a solution in sight. I'll quickly go through this. These are then what I felt in doing that kind of work we were playing with. One was building a narrative. And why we built narratives? We built narratives in order to kind of legitimize the big picture. And those narratives changed. They weren't precise. They weren't epistemic in that sense. They were imprecise. And sometimes they were, they were bits of storytelling. But it was important to continually bring up narratives in order to construct legitimacy into what we were trying to do. Second was networks. <coughs> So we were doing work, but in actual fact, the ones who were at the spearhead, the ones who were fronting much of this, were, let's call them, professionals with a reformist agenda. People who knew how the political system worked, but also knew what the policy mood was and what could be engaged with and what couldn't be. These were the ones that had to be brought in to the debate, because these are the ones that they were presenting the debate to the political system, if you want. Dialogue, which was ongoing, and the idea there was, of course, we were never going to win through evidence alone. The evidence was there. We were never going to win just by what works. We had that evidence as well. We would only win if someone was persuaded. And we couldn't do the persuading. They had to do the persuasion. We could always stand at the back. But what did that persuasion then look like? Well, over the years we made some mistakes. Creating an all-parliamentary group on extreme poverty, um, setting up a kind of public-orientated um, manifesto for extreme poverty, 
and then working closer with parliamentarians around the seventh year plan. So some things worked, some things didn't work, but the idea was the dialogue somehow had to be kept open, and who you were dialoguing with had to be accepted people that we were very clear about. As in inevitable, some of it was about timing, and that's just opportunism. This wasn't planned. Some of it was planned, some of it was responded to. And of course, in doing all of that, we made errors. And I don't know what the other side of that is, and that's part of the... Yes. So why is that important? This is the last slide. We're moving on to different questions. So rather than ask what does qualitative or what kind of knowledge can influence policy, whether it be quantitative or qualitative, etc., we need to ask more interesting questions about policy and the way that knowledge relates to it. I put up three there. How do the different types of knowledge, from the epistemic down to the frenetic, how do they come together? And how do they mix? And how are those contradictions and mixes managed? And in the end, I suppose, um, does it make or is it making the, the policy um, process and, of course, the institution of that any better? So it's an invitation, again, to not get dragged back into the quant qual divide, but actually to start thinking about knowledge more vertically <coughs> and having a stronger sense that of those three types of knowledge, not only should we shy away or else just accommodate values because of reflexivity or positionality, but actually see values as the main driver of potential policy engagement and policy change. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rana. Um, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much, uh, Theo and, uh, and Joe, for making it my life much easier. I'll begin by congratulating you uh, in Bath. Um, it's always a great pleasure to be back in Bath, beautiful Bath. Um, uh, the changes in climate notwithstanding, I'm sure uh, we, we'll talk about this for many more years to come. Uh, one of the things that I was asked to do was uh, to look at what evidence counts. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, um, I was told many years back that when you have little time, you begin with your conclusion. Uh, so I'll begin with my conclusions so that uh, if I don't get there, you know where I was heading in the first place. Uh, has a good case been made uh, for social protection through research in East Africa? Yes. Two. Is the policy response uh, consistent with the evidence? Sort of. Um, not very, very good. Are uh, the research and policy communities communicating effectively? A lot more needs to be done. Actually, a lot more innovation. Now, um, the discussion about evidence being <coughs> important for policy making is not new. We all know that uh, when Galileo Galilei was uh, locked up in his room or kept, house, uh, kept under house arrest uh, for much of his life. Uh, he was uh, trying to say, well, there is this evidence, and um, so you should be uh, following it. Well, he was locked away. Why was that the case? Um, I would like to pose uh, a couple of other questions in addition to the bigger question. When does evidence actually count? Under what conditions does it count? Um, and uh, make the most Im uh, impact? What role uh, does or has evidence played or does it play in social protection policy making in East Africa? And what are the main barriers to uptake? Now, as you can see, I'm not giving you a PowerPoint presentation um, because I want, I'm, I'm just a storyteller uh, after uh, the elaborate discussion of process and content and theory uh, has been uh, laid out. And uh, in my part of the world, you looked at, at the storyteller, not at the wall. Uh, so, so, so the story is, uh, go, goes like this. Uh, many years back, when I was a student at university, and I went to university during uh, Idi Amin's Uganda, um, I was told that knowledge doesn't count, power does. Uh, and everybody was told again and again, it's power that matters. And then uh, later, uh, in 1988, I had the benefit, I, I was privileged to work with the disability organization, an organization working with disabled people. And I realized how important it was uh, to listen in 
to voices and have these voices articulated uh, in development planning and policy. But then I was asking myself, how do you move beyond uh, this? Later, uh, I was involved in work uh, that went out to get voices of the poor from the poor themselves and to try and articulate these voices to those in government. It was a total failure. Uh, not, the, not the articulation, I, can, I think we collect, collected the voices, but then no one was prepared to listen. We couldn't even find the way to get through the corridor, into the corridors of power. That was uh, quite a challenge. Um, in 1997, I, together with others, we established um, what we called uh, a thinking space. Others call them think tanks these days. Uh, a thinking space where uh, discussions were being generated on how voices and evidence can be brought together uh, with those in the policy-making world to try and create uh, uh, you know, an ecosystem of uh, like-minded uh, uh, people from different walks of life. It did, we made some progress, but um, there were challenges. The first breakthrough was when we worked with the University of Birmingham uh, in the remote part of Uganda, doing an evaluation, and I was tasked with uh, raising the voices of the poor in a district which had been receiving lots of Danish aid. Um, and, uh, and try to bring these voices into an, in an evaluation piece. Now, um, someone said, this is very, very good. I said, well, um, I think this, uh, we've been saying this for a long, long time. Uh, so why is it that it's only the first time that we're recognizing this? The reason was, uh, previously, it was I and a small group of people in Uganda. This time, the University of Birmingham was involved. So it must be important. Um, Later, uh, we worked, and uh, I can see Tony here, um, with the Chronic Poverty Research Center uh, uni and the universities across the north and other organizations across the world, uh, all saying there is a theory behind understanding policy, there's the theory behind understanding poverty, there's a the theory behind uh, processes that link poverty understanding to policy responses, etc., etc. And then the rest of the world started listening. We had been saying this for more than 10 years uh, previously. Um, when the World Bank in 2000 uh, did their Voices of the Poor, uh, 1999 to 2000, actually we had been doing that for seven years previously, and no one had been uh, listening. But of course, that's the World Bank. It's not small people sitting in a, uh, a, a, a small unknown country. Uh, in 2006, for the first time, African leaders gathered uh, in Z Zambia, Livingstone, and deliberated on the need to respond to the poverty question that was uh, becoming bigger and bigger, uh, had been recognized before, but this time they wanted to do something um, and uh, came up with the Livingstone call for action on social protection. The first time we hear uh, the, the term uh, acknowledged. Uh, interestingly, uh, unfortunately, I didn't go to the conference. However, the reason was because there was, there was only one ticket, and I preferred that the person who goes to the conference is the government person, the senior person in government. And I actually wrote uh, all the background papers and made this one available to, to, to him. Now, what does it mean? Uh, what, what does it mean uh, for, uh, for for us to reflect on this uh, these kinds of uh, uh, questions? Um, when uh, and 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 what what evidence? Uh, what is the evidence uh, uh, that we have been receiving uh, previously? First of all, there is the very well rehearsed um, uh, you know, retinue of, uh, of points that have been made about evidence in the social protection arena, uh, in Uganda and Kenya in spe in specifically, but elsewhere in Africa as well. We've been hearing that it's not affordable. We've been hearing that there isn't institutional capacity to implement. 
We've been hearing that it's not sustainable. We've been hearing that there isn't good ac acceptability and that sometimes the targeting mechanisms are not very good. But social protection has always been there. Traditional mechanisms have always been there. So one would have expected that since it was already there, um, introduction of the approach would have been uh, seamless, would have been very easy, but it wasn't. Um, instead, uh, what we, we've been seeing is a narrow agenda, uh, not sometimes uh, dominated by conditional and unconditional cash transfers, uh, not the broader understanding of what social protection should entail. And that uh, created um, uh, one of the first challenges. And the underlying reasons for this failure for me uh, are, uh, whereas in the past, Society relied uh, on family and kinship relationships to support their social protection, and no distinction was there between home and work. Uh, now we have a workplace, we also have uh, workers and non-workers, and therefore there is an issue uh, about what kind of social protection you, you, can, uh, you, you can do. So what role has research played in these circumstances? We know from the chronic poverty research that uh, at least 25 million East Africans out of a population of about 44 are uh, in extreme and chronic poverty. We know that already. And that is using a very generous description of uh, poverty. Uh, if we became more rigorous, we would probably be talking about uh, bigger numbers. We also know that uh, countries have been growing in terms of uh, uh, economic growth. So, it's not, we're not short of economic growth, but we are short of poverty eradication. Uh, we know that uh, a number of studies have already been, uh, uh, have been taking place. Now, what has not happened, however, is the coming together uh, of the research world and the political world and the entrepreneurs because you need those who make decisions, those who research and those who, who are entrepreneurs bringing the two together uh, who are making sure that uh, things uh, that you're talking about uh, rhyme well or somehow, somehow uh, take advantage uh, of uh, th things uh, uh, that can be done. Um, and to make things worse, most policymakers have reduced the agenda to just uh, the social protection agenda to just safety nets, um, and that plays into the World Bank, IMF, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, I, I, ideology, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, instead of then dealing with the mainstream issue of addressing long-term, extreme, and chronic poverty. Uh, it is about trying to, to see how do we work with those who might be falling uh, into poverty. Uh, but actually, there are lots and lots that are falling into that. We're not talking about a residual situation. We're talking about masses that are falling uh, into, uh, in, into, into uh, poverty. Now, I know that time is not on, on, on our side. I, I, I want to, uh, to make a few pr propositions or to make a few observations. The first one <clears throat> is that uh, there is a distinction, a very clear distinction, between uh, what the policymakers have been expecting uh, in East Africa, growth and growth and more growth, and what citizens have been uh, and continue to yearn for uh, improved livelihoods. There is also sectorization and projectization of development. By sectorization, I know that you, most of us know that we, we work in education, health, agriculture, etc., etc., sectors. When you ask someone, how would inputs in agriculture help outcomes in health, they would think there's something a bit wrong with you. Uh, it has to be education inputs for education outputs and outcomes, etc., etc. Now, how can inputs in social protection 
uh, help outcomes in education, health, agriculture, and livelihoods uh, overall. These questions are not being asked, and this is the question I want to put to, to us all. Uh, is social protection just another of those sectors? And even when we go to pilot and try out things, do we pilot uh, in this sectorized and projectized uh, way to the detriment of uh, overarching development? What is the overarching question, that development question we are posing and trying to answer and working with others on uh, so that we can find uh, a solution? Um, I know these are very big questions. Uh, I would like us to, uh, to think about them and um, uh, I'm going to be available for the next two days and uh, I would like to, 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 to say that um, as we think about this, uh, let's not only think about uh, evidence just as a way of doing the next research piece, but evidence in a much more holistic manner, so which is beyond the theoretical and analytical um, uh, approaches to answering a set of questions or one question or a set of questions, but rather uh, what in totality is out there, not just in academia, but also uh, amongst uh, societies out there, in communities, ways of doing things, the politics of doing decision making. When Idi Amin said knowledge was not important, I, I, I frowned very seriously. Um, but you can forgive Idi Amin because he was Idi Amin. But when that happens in 2016, uh, and people still come back and uh, infer to you that uh, it's not, it's not the evidence, it's not the analysis, it's not the discussion, it is the power, it is the attitudes. Then I have a question mark. I would like to think that Idi Amin was right. But if that is what it draws one to, to concluding, then I think there is an issue that we need to discuss. Thank you very much.